I'm happy to introduce our keynote speaker, Beth Gibbons. Beth is the Executive Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, or ASAP. In this role, she is responsible for strengthening the capacities of individual adaptation professionals, uh, adaptation and resilience or oriented organizations, and accelerating the evolution of the adaptation field of practice. Beth brings over a decade of experience in sustainable development and climate adaptation to her role. Prior to joining ASAP, Beth directed the University of Michigan's Climate Center and managed NOAA's Great Lakes Regional Integrated Sciences and Assessments Center. Beth served in the Peace Corps in the nation of Togo and holds a Master of Urban Planning from the University of Michigan. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to extend my thanks to Joel um, and to the whole planning team for this conference. It is such an honor for me to be invited here today to speak with all of you, to kick off the conversations um, that'll be taking place, to hope to provide some additional um, foundation for these goals that we're going for today of crossing boundaries and sparking collaborations. Um, I'm so grateful to Deanna Standing Cloud for the words that she gave us this morning. Um, the words of remembering to go together, to go with intention and to go gently um, because this work is challenging and it's really through those collaborations, the work being together that we really can move action. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and my background, uh, how I came to this work. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the moment that we're in today, um, as I sometimes call it the adaptation imperative that we're living in. I'm gonna talk some about some case studies, and at that point I'm probably gonna do my best to call out the actual experts in the room because my job is connecting people to each other um, and really just kind of collecting the top line story. But I know the people in the room are the, really the ones that can tell the nitty gritty. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why Minnesota is so great. And uh, I feel like I'm going to have a pretty receptive crowd for that. So I look forward to it. <laughs> I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Cooperstown. And Cooperstown, New York, in addition to being known as the home of baseball, is also America's most perfect village. And if you don't believe it, we have it on authority from the son of our founder, James Fenimore Cooper, who said, everybody says it, and what everybody says, it must be true. <laughs> I grew up in this small town, three miles outside of the village on a dirt road. Um, and the way that I grew up, first in a restaurant where we were always serving people, living upstairs from the bar, and then moving from that life um, to where my dad became a public school teacher, and my mom became the director of an environmental nonprofit that worked to protect this lake, Lake Otsego, a lake that is nine miles by two miles, but 163 feet deep, this kind of profound little lake it also stands as the headwater to the east mighty river, the Susquehanna. My mom went from working in an environmental organization and after 10 years became the director of the Chamber of Commerce. And in all of that, our family did the work. At the environmental group, we would sit in the evening, we would stuff envelopes, we would stuff appeals, we would learn about runoff and about the effects that Walmart trucks were starting to take on the roads that ran through our small towns. And when she was with the Chamber of Commerce, we would go out and we would stand in the cold in an autumn day and we would weigh giant pumpkins that people would bring from across the region so that we were building up not just the baseball tourism, but the shoulder seasons. And there was never a question in our house or in my life about whether or not the well-being of this lake in this place was tied to the economy and whether or not the businesses were tied to the lake, it was just known. It was understood. 
that we couldn't do one without the other. And, and as I've gone on in my work, I find that so often we want to pit these kinds of interests against each other <laughs> instead of finding the place of collaboration and finding where we have these aligned values. And so I feel grateful for where I started from because it taught me that. But it also taught me something really important and really deep when I was very young. And I realized that no matter what might happen to my family, I had a deep sense of place. And I could always go home. And home meant this. It meant this town of 2,030 people on the edge of a lake in upstate New York. And if that's what it meant for me to have to go back to the beginning and start again, then my sense of place and my sense of home also gave me an intense sense of purpose and a sense of obligation. And that if I could spend my life finding ways to build relationships and to build connections and to help other people to also have that sense of place and sense of security, then that's what I would do. And so that's what I've tried to do. And so I took that river that starts in Cooperstown as just a stream, and I followed it down the Chesapeake to DC. And I spent the next 10 years, well first I spent four years, going to college. And in college, really finding I had this passion, not just the idea of service, but really, how do you do development work? How do you develop community? How do you lead from behind? How do you build participatory action? And I started first working on HIV AIDS as a logistics coordinator. I helped people get out to clinical sites, tried to find roads where there weren't roads, tried to deliver medicine where there wasn't refrigeration. But I was doing it from the US from Silver Spring, Maryland, which is like a really kind of soulless place. But, um, <laughs> it was, and I had friends and they said, Beth, you gotta go. You've got to go. And so I went. Um, I joined the Peace Corps and I had the opportunity to live in this small village, a real village. You know, I grew up in a little village, but then I found out what a village really can be. Um, at the end of another dirt road, and a village of 400 people. And we worked on sustainable agriculture. And this is Togo, West Africa. It was a rainforest. And there's not a lot of rain, and there's not a lot of forest left there right now. We worked on introducing agroforestry. We worked on introducing cover crops. We introduced sustainable agricultural practices so that farmers that we're worried about today might be able to sustain their family, not just today, but in five years, and in 10 years, and in 15 years. And the work feels really familiar to me today. The conversations were hard there, and it took trust, and it took time, and it took me spending countless hours basically drinking soda bee, which is really bad alcohol. <laughs> but you do it, you know, you make it work. And all volunteers have a few things that they need to bring to their job. A strong stomach, <coughs> deep sense of humility, and you have to love to read. And, and I did. And when I was there, I fell in love with science fiction. And I fell in love with sci-fi, I think because I was in a place that was so different than where I had been. And it was able for me to open up the idea of anything being possible of where we could go. Um, you know, reading sci-fi became foundational for me and has continued to be because as a Western person, I didn't have the foundations that Deanna Standing Cloud talked about today to see this as, oops, as our turtle island. And so I had to learn it from someplace else to be able to connect the past to today, to the future. But I think that there is so much opportunity for us as we're thinking about where do we need to go 
and where have we come from? And the thing that I equate it to now, I have a, a three, a four, and a 14-year-old. And as I was preparing for my 14-year-old to go into high school, I thought to myself, man, this is like time travel. It's like economy class time travel. That's what it is. That's what I'm doing as a parent. And, and in the same way, it's really made me appreciate the uncertainty. Parenting, you know, I know the story up until now. I know what the inflection points have been. I know where some of my mistakes have been. And I think where some of my successes have been. Yet so much is left and so much uncertainty remains. And that's so much how it is with our climate. We control so much of it, but still so much remains out of our hands. And we have to do our part right now as we're sitting in this adaptation space to forge the future that we want to have. I feel like we need to experience time differently. We need to see it uh, with our terrific successes that have propelled us forward to where we are. We have to see it marred by our devastating failures, the ways that we have failed to treat people as we should, the ways that we have failed in the way we build our cities, in the ways that we treat our environment, how we haven't always reached across those connection points to spark collaboration instead just sparking these fires. But we need to see today not as static, but as evolving and accept that the future is unknown and also accept that we have so much that we can do. And we need to do this and we need to learn not just from our own culture, you know, not just from not just from the fantasy of the science fiction, but from the stories that we hear from our neighbors, from our colleagues, from the traditional ecological knowledge that speaks to us from seven generations past and will speak to us for seven generations forward. And there is so much opportunity in this moment for us. And there's a lot of work that's happening. So, a little bit about what I see right now. It's 2020 is pretty exciting. We saw in the last year some pretty significant pieces of action come into our, our kind of world. Here's a group of entities that aren't always at our table and haven't been at our table up until now. Moody's, which provides bond ratings for cities across the country, had been talking about for several years that they were going to start including climate risk in how they bond how they rank bonds, and this year they took a step and they acquired a company to actually bring that internally, 427, that can actually do risk assessment. We saw global resilience bond standards be released. So we're not just hearing the talk, we're seeing the action, we're seeing the banking and the financial community start to move. And we see this not just that they are releasing standards, those seven standards that they set also put equity in the middle. And they said that this industry, and if we're going to have bonds and we're going to use resilience bonds, they have to recognize justice. And they have to recognize how to do this work equitably. What a win for us when we look for collaboration points. What a win for us to then say, are you being authentic to your seven standards for resilience bonds? Because they wrote it in. We can ask the question. TCFD, the Task Force on Climate, Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, gave us an outline of how companies need to start disclosing their climate risk. And in 2019, we started to really see a pivot. What we had seen a lot of up until now was that companies were disclosing what would happen to their bottom line if they had to reduce their carbon emission to be within two degrees. But instead, we started to see them say, what's going to happen to our bottom line from physical and material risk? and they're asking a different question, and they're starting to invest in this question, and when they invest, it means that the communities where their assets exist get that investment. And so we see this space that's an opportunity, but a deep need, because you can't have a company that has a facility in a city and have a mismatched climate assessment. That's gonna cause all kinds of chaos up there in the Moody's marketplace. But we see this, it's happening, the private sector is moving and we see a reflection of it and that the adaptation and resilience marketplace, the service marketplace is valued at 650 million annually. And so 
the private sector hasn't <laughs> hasn't ever saved us, but it's hard to move without it. And they're moving, and they're moving fast, and they will move fast. And so for those of you who do this work, who've done this work, and who will do this work, keeping that private sector, that new collaborator in check, bringing them into line with the values that you hold, as we hope that everyone in this room holds similar values, there's a new group of actors, and they need to be brought into those values. And the good news is there's a lot of people who think that too. And we saw in 2019 an incredible movement happen around the world. I wouldn't say that it was started by Greta Thunberg, but she brought this forward. She found a way to give voice to a conversation that was being had in communities and villages across reservations, across the world. She became an unlikely mouthpiece for this. And we've seen this work be able to galvanize action across diverse people. And when you get the financial industry and you get the people, you start to get the politics. Because what happens when you have the will of the people and when you have the desire of business, that mountain of uncertainty, which we've been shaving down both by good science and by the simple fact that you can't deny that these storms are getting bigger and worse. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But you start to see the mountain of uncertainty getting shaved down, even on Capitol Hill, perhaps the biggest mountain of uncertainty that we have. And we saw the introduction of the Green New Deal, which is quite short, and I recommend that everybody read it. It's about 11 pages, and it gets billed as a climate mitigation plan, but it's actually a climate adaptation plan. All climate adaptation work done well includes mitigation. If you're not mitigating in your adaptation work, then I'm sorry to let you know, but you're not doing it well. This has to happen. It is inherent in the job. The Green New Deal is about healthcare, education, housing, jobs, local jobs, the way that you can use the federal government and your state government as a facilitator and a coordinator for grassroots effort. It's really remarkable. We saw this year the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis call for policy recommendations that they're preparing for 2020 and 2021. We saw the Senate Democrats Special Committee on the Climate Crisis stand up and begin collecting their policy ideas. And while I think that the Democrats Special Committee is interesting, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis is really one to watch because it's bipartisan and it's really working on behalf largely of senators and reps in the Southeast who see what's happening, who feel the pressure of climate impacts in their communities and are trying to figure out what can we do. And we saw an amazing coming together of big green organizations and the release of the Environmental Justice Initiative and Platform. And this really centered NAACP and it centered them and brought around their mission, Sierra Club, NRDC, um, WWF to say, if you're going to do environmental work, you're going to center justice and equity. And they said, yes. Um, I spent earlier in December a weekend with the Sierra Club chapter policy directors and talked about what does it mean to reorient your work to fit this new justice platform? They're integrating it all the way down. And I found that really remarkable. And it's good that we're doing it because the news is not always good. Um, the $2019 billion weather and climate disaster report is out. 2019 is the fifth consecutive year in which 10 or more billion dollar weather and climate disaster events have impacted the United States. And we see these disasters, some of them are ones that we know. We see the California fires. We know PG&E had their remarkable deficiency in stewardship. We know that we lost 
We actually lost Paradise in 2018. I was thinking 2019. But 2019 has continued those fires. We see the hurricane that wasn't Dorian. People talked about how much it missed, but it didn't miss. We just stopped watching. It came, it hit, it was a billion dollar disaster. And of course we have the North Central flooding, which I know so many of you experienced or responded to. But we know billion dollar disasters aren't the whole story. They're the headline. But these floods, the July floods in the Twin Cities, that terrific day of rain that fell, the storms in Duluth that sit the way that the Lake Superior has just risen and risen and risen, those aren't billion dollar disasters, but they are the disasters, they are the tiny cuts, the death by a thousand cuts that makes climate change for us in this region so devastating and it requires so much resilience for us to withstand event to event and to be able to learn and to respond in time so that we can be better prepared for the next event, which isn't going to come in 100 years, but in 10 or two or one. And we have a lot of work to do to prepare for those events. The 2017 infrastructure report card from the American Society of Civil Engineers reminds us this may be one year's report, but it's cumulative and it's national. We have a $2 trillion infrastructure deficit. Had we begun our investment in 2017 or 2018 at the release of this report, we were looking at a need for $3.9 trillion to be invested to install the resilient infrastructure necessary to bring our grade from a D minus to a C plus. But we have a lot of opportunity because when we need that much infrastructure, when we need that much investment, we've learned a lot. We've learned a lot. Well, we haven't done a lot, we've learned a lot. The return on investment for resilient infrastructure is one to six. So we know that if we start investing in our infrastructure with an eye towards resilience, that we can get more out of that investment, that we can do better. We also know that there's this marketplace that's growing that I talked about originally. The marketplace for people who want to plan with an eye towards resilience, who want to implement infrastructure with an eye towards resilience. And good news, in Minnesota, you're already out of sea. So, and you're definitely out of the rest of the country, but there's room for improvement, as I would say, were my newly minted high schooler to bring me home this report card. I'm not sure <laughs> that it would get the ice cream he was potentially hoping for, but it's a good start. And there's a lot of opportunity. And there's more. It was a rough year. You know, go gently, go together, because we need to, because we learned this year that we're missing our targets, that we're losing our land, that we are having a devastating effect on the beings whom we share this world with. Um, and so we hope as we go forward that we can think that the beginning is always today and we can begin and we can begin this work together. And so I want you to look at your these things, pigeon holes, I guess. Um, because I know that we're gonna do some Q&A in a little while, but I wanna hear from you. What gives you hope? What motivates you? And what must we change? Because the work that I do, I get to really sit between people, to hear your stories, to collect them. And it's not just me. I get to do this as ASAP, which is awesome. I feel honored to be with the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, to have my job be to collect the stories, to disseminate those stories, to draw connections. And so I wanna do a little bit of that work as we're here together. I am going to walk through some case studies next. And as I walk through these case studies, I am not the expert. I am the storyteller, I am the connector. I am here to help you 
to solve your challenges. It's one of my superpowers, I say. My superpower is to find out what you need and to then go out and get it for you. When I was little, it used to be cups of coffee. Now it's things like you know, more resilient infrastructure to increase freeze-thaw cycles in the Northwest, something like that. But as I come to these different case studies, if you are familiar with them, or you are somebody who has worked on them, or you are somebody who maybe wrote the book on it, I want to invite you to stand up so that other people in the room can know who you are, so they don't ask me for more information, they just find you. Um, but so I can also see you and I can point to you when questions come up. We're going to talk a little bit about finance. We're going to talk about traditional ecological knowledge. We're going to talk about water and climate, policy and ag. Um, and we're going to talk about work that is hard. Um, I'm not sure how much you've been following, but along these slides I've been dropping some of my favorite quotes that I take from sci-fi authors and, and this from H.G. Wells. The path of least resistance is the path of the loser. So let's see what the hard work looks like. Yeah, okay, that was a little harsh maybe, but. <laughs> so the first project I want to talk about is the GWOW project. This comes out of work that has been a coordination between the Sioux tribe, the Ojibwe tribe of Sioux, nope, sorry, Lake Superior Ojibwe tribe and coordinating with Wisconsin Sea Grant. And what they have worked toward isn't just this goal of recognizing traditional ecological knowledge, but actually integrating the traditional ecological knowledge into their climate assessments and their climate curriculum. And they've done this through coaching students and curriculum writers into asking four key questions. First is, do culture and science agree? And so they're saying that our traditional ecological knowledge gives us a unique perspective on what is climate change, what is interannual variability, and what is weather. And here's our experience of phenology, and here's our experience of change. Now what does the climate science say? Do they agree? They ask the next question, is climate change affecting the sustainability of our key species that support cultural practice of value? So then asking these curriculum writers, the students going through these processes, going through these training vignettes and saying, let's think about the change and now we want you to think about what does this look like in relationship to our practices and the way that we have lived and worked and played on this land. And then what is the future for this cultural practice based in place-based evidence and scientific climate change projections? So saying, we are resilient people. We have lived through change. Change in being prepared to adapt has been required of us to maintain our lives wherever we have had to live them. So how will we adapt? And what will the change be in the future? How extreme is our threat and how totally capable are we of the adaptation that may be necessary? And then what do these changes mean for the environment, the community, and the economy? This packet that they've developed, this GWOW program, is both a program for those who come to it, who want to experience the curriculum, the guide, the lessons plans, but they also have established it so that if you want to create your own climate center and your own climate instruction program based on this, then you can do that. Is there anyone in the room who's familiar with this program? Excellent. So we have some folks from Glyphwick, awesome. And then I don't know who is back there, but so you can find some folks who might want to talk with you about this. <clears throat> the 2018 Farm Bill and Soil Health Pilot Program. So this project uh, was, I think, a terrific undertaking by a unique group of collaborators the American Coalition of Ethanol, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, E2, and the Minnesota Farmers Union. This effort brought together the largest farm bill allocation for soil health measures, including no-till farming, incentives for cover crops, and really using the language of soil health pilot to move an adaptation and resilience program forward. As one person put it, it's the first of its kind provision in the farm bill this first of its kind provision in the Farm Bill plants an important new seed for climate action. 
And the Soil Health Pilot Program is an exciting example of what can be achieved when groups with diverse perspectives constructively work together with lawmakers. This project was uh, advocated for by Representative Peterson from Minnesota and really driven with support from the Minnesota Farmers Union, thinking about what will we need in order to sustain the agricultural foundation that we have here and to be able to thrive. It was followed up in 2019 by a $4.3 million of allocation in the Forever Green funding from the Minnesota legislative session, really focusing on how can we continue to create cutting edge science to develop creative markets for cover crops, perennials, and other soil health benefits. These moments when you can see an integration of the health of our industries of agriculture of the planet really matching up with the policy makers, matching up with our adaptation initiatives. I talked a little bit already, I guess, about Duluth and those storms, but they're pretty remarkable. And I love Duluth. So there's that. I will go out of my way. I, in some ways, I feel like if you're going to Duluth, not intentionally, you are by nature just going out of your way. I'll go out of my way to go to Amazing Grace Bakery if I can, to sit there at the end of Lake Superior to imagine what's going on from that, from that point that flows through so many places that I care about. We saw an incredible year on Lake Superior and all of the lakes. But monthly record highs in June, July, August, September, October missed its high by 1.1 inch. And the result of that was just an absolute beating on the lake walk. But it wasn't the first time that that lake walk has experienced it. It's had terrific storms in October of 2017, in April of 2018, in October of 2018, in April of 2019, um, these storms just come. They come and they come. And they've invested a terrific amount of money in it and a terrific amount of money in the resilience of it. And not just in rebuilding it and not just putting it back as it had been, but really thinking about how do we modify this? We know this is an asset for the community, so how do we elevate it? Elevating the boardwalk, adapting the retaining wall to put it on a slant to be able to absorb more of the wave impact in bringing in larger sto stones. In the next year, they'll bring in 77,000 tons of boulders to continue creating more resilience. And it's not perfect. The boardwalk still got washed out, right? But the stones held. And if you talk to the people who've been working on this, they see it as a success. And they feel like what we're doing is we're learning and we're adapting and we're making some place which is an asset to our community livable and viable in the face of increasing storms. Who's familiar? Oh, I didn't do this for the last one, sorry. Who's familiar with the soil health project, the soil health pilot? Shoot, all right. I can be an expert on that, noted. <laughs> Who's familiar with the Duluth Resilience Infrastructure? Yes, oh, there we go, excellent. Good, good, good. Okay, we've got some folks over here, up in the front. So this is one of um, a more a somewhat complicated, but really one of my favorite projects to talk about. The public-private partnership that the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewer District is undertaking. Um, is anybody here familiar with the work of MMSD, the Milwaukee Metropolitan? Yep, right down the middle, a little bit over here, good. So MMSD has just been doing amazing work over the last 20 years thinking about their infrastructure, how to bring in green infrastructure, how to bring in mixed, um, mixed types of revenue to work on, mixed investment to work on their infrastructure efforts. The result of their investments and their efforts at green infrastructure has been a reduction in overflow events from 50 to 60 a year in the early 1990s to 2.3 annually in 2019, and they have an ambition to be at zero by 2035. That goal, as Kevin Schaefer, the executive director there, says that that's not being driven by a lawsuit or poor financials, but 
we're, if we're ever going to see the environment restored to what it was 40 or 50 years ago, we need to do something different than what we've been doing. And he's saying, you know, that view, if we want what we had, we need to change what we do. That we value the past, we value the place, but we cannot do things the same way. And he brings this air of pragmatism and optimism and activation to his work. He brings it so much so that he sat in a meeting with a series of bond rating agencies, Moody's, S&P, and Fitch, and started talking about what he has done through MMSD to add resilience through the installation of green infrastructure. And they said to him, Kevin, does your CFO consider that when they're talking about their cash reserves, how much more resilience there is in your system? And he said, I don't know. And they said, Kevin, why don't you talk with your CFO and see if he can report on the resilience of the system? And so he did. And so his CFO reported on their work. And so they freed up $35 million of cash assets because the bond agency said, that cash that you're sitting on isn't doing you any good, but we'd like to see it activated so that you can become even more resilient. That kind of thinking, that kind of conversation happens when people reach across boundaries and they spark these collaborations. And then they come back and they say, how can we take a conversation and turn it into action and turn it into $35 million, which is a lot, but of course leaves a lot still to be done. And so Kevin says, that was good, but let's do more. Let's set up this public-private partnership opportunity and have a private partner find a way to install green infrastructure that can absorb up to an additional 50 million gallons of water. And that challenge has been laid out there. They're working with environmental consulting technology through the support of the Great Lakes Protection Fund. They're replicating successful work that was done outside of DC and in the city of DC on their stormwater efforts. And they're really driving an innovative approach to how do you fund this work? How do you get it done? And they're doing it because of that goal, not just because they want something new, not just because they want something different, but because they want to restore something there. If we want to restore the environment from 40 or 50 years ago, we have to do something different. To look to the past and hold the past, we need to change the now so that our future is what we want it to be. And so we move forward and it's 2020 and it's a new decade of action. And here we are in Minnesota. This is the part where I tell you how great Minnesota is. It's gonna be great. Um, I, I really do, I like everywhere I work, um, but I've been coming to work in Minnesota for the last decade and in the Twin Cities, in the metro area, in Duluth, with 1854 Treaty Authority. Um, and I think about Minnesota in the land of 10,000 lakes, and think about what that means as the sentinel state to these incredibly important waters. The waters that are within the state and the waters that extend beyond the state. In the Great Lakes Basin, there's 60 million people. In the Mississippi River Basin, there's 30 million people. Those people and those waters that they depend on start here. And so I think about Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes, but I really prefer Minnesota, the star of the north. And I think about that word, the star of the north, and it can provide us so much as a sentinel to these critical waters. And it's important that we are thinking about it because climate change here has a different flavor. We see challenges. We've talked about a lot of them. There's more rain, less water when you need it, more water when you don't. 
we see increases in heat, increases in variability, but we also see this terrific opportunity for growth and an opportunity to really seize a moment in time when you have a state which is disposed to welcoming people, a state that is known for its ability to bring in, absorb, and welcome those cultures, the state that has the highest refugee population per capita, um, a place where when one city said they were going to vote no against continuing the refugee resettlement project, 25 other cities said, no, that won't be our story. We're gonna vote yes, and we will continue these programs. And when we think about the opportunity for growth, we think about it not just in the people, who will come, not just in agriculture, where Minnesota is already the fifth highest producing ag state in the country, a state that knows how to produce and how to feed, how to be part of this agricultural complex, and so important that is because other parts of our country are losing their agricultural competitiveness. And whether it's corn or soybeans or, com or specialty crops, they are shifting north and they will continue to shift north and how important it is that there are the conversations that are already happening here about soil health and about how do we capture more of an industry that can fuel so much of our economy but also can put so much of what we value at risk when not well managed. And so there are such great opportunities. And the opportunities aren't just inherent in what is here, but it's also in what's happening to places away from here. We expect to see 45 million people in neighborhoods that flood at least once annually by 2100 with an expectation of just three feet of sea level rise. And that three feet of sea level rise is, by all counts, an underestimation at this point. We expect to see at least 13.1 million people pushed out of their homes by 2100, and that's in the US. That's talking about internal to the US where people will be having to move around. And so we expect to see a massive reordering of population and population centers. And so it is so, so good that there are so many people here who are prepared to be thinking about this work. And, and I start with the dog mushers in Ely. This matter of fact pragmatism that they bring to their work. That they say that we have a $1.5 million industry here, but our season is shortened by up to a month. And that is climate change. And they say it unapologetically, and they say it because they have to. Because they have to be thinking about what will we do here? I think about the philanthropies that you have here. And some are big philanthropies. Maybe it's McKnight or Will Steger. But really what I think about is actually the spirit of philanthropy in Minnesota. Did you know that Minnesota um, is, has the highest individual rate of philanthropy in the country? The greatest rate of giving. I think about your climatologists, Kenny Blumenfeld and Mark. And they are people who will just go out and say, this is what's happening. They go out and after the dog sledders give their presentation and talk, then they'll stand up and say, yes. And you need to take action. They are courageous. They are not afraid that their title as scientists doesn't allow them to also inform the politics of the day. You have the political leadership from Representative Peterson that I talked about with the Farm Bill but from Representative Craig, who introduced one of the most non logical pieces of legislation last year in the House, which was the Resilience Revolving Loan Fund Act of 2019 that would update the Stafford Act to actually start putting funding where it should be in disasters, which is ahead of it, not behind it. It's sitting, of course, between the houses, but it's there, it's written, and it's a good piece of legislation. And then you have all of you, the adaptation specialists, who are out there, whether they are in the 1854 Treaty Authority, whether they are um, in your individual cities, in Duluth, 
in Egan. Maybe they are at the state in your universities. And there's so, so much here to build on. And so we put all of this together and we start with what we know and the places that are home and the connections that we've built and that we will continue to build. And then we move forward. And whether we are engineers or we are empaths, we do this work knowing that we will boldly go where no one has gone before. <laughs> Thank you all very much.